So just to set the stage a little bit, um, I love this quotation from uh, then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations when he was opening the negotiations to the Paris Agreement. Back in 2014, he had some interesting comments uh, that he presented to the delegations that were there and to the media that were there. And I want to pick up two points here. So first, uh, he said, the human environmental and financial cost of climate change is fast becoming unbearable. We need a clear, shared vision. And that's going to be the first point. And then second, to ride this storm, we need all hands on deck. Today, we must set, a new, uh, set the world on a new course. Now, let's look at each of those individually. For the first, uh, we do need a, a clear, shared vision. And we're living in a, a country right now that doesn't have a clear, shared vision for this. And so ideally, we would be moving towards um, a state where we are acting cooperatively in a legal, social manner uh, that's cutting across levels of government uh, to achieve a, a common goal or a common objective. Um, it's cutting in and out, yeah? yeah. Badly? You want me just to yell? Is it? I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Everyone can hear me? Okay. So we'll put technology away. All right. So we need a clear uh, uh, shared vision. So this means ideally you'd have Canada acting cooperatively across levels of government. Uh, something we know, you know, exists to a certain extent, but uh, not to the full extent that we could ideally achieve. And second is this interesting uh, analogy to all hands on deck at the time of a storm to ride out the issue that we're experiencing. This has largely been interpreted as saying we need both governments and civil society. So we need, right, we need non-government actors to start taking a role uh, in addressing the climate change issue. But I think from a legal perspective, you can look at a, uh, a quote like that and say what we're ultimately going to need or what we are ultimately going to see is all manner of legal action engaged. Okay, so it's not going to be something that uh, you know occurs as a result of one federal piece of legislation or one provincial policy on oil sands. Okay, it's going to be something that is going to, to require really a collective legal response that comes at it from multiple angles. Whether it's future climate mitigation, it's ongoing climate adaptation, it's regulation in various forms, or as is relevant to today's discussion, it's litigation. Okay, so it's all the Asians, right? They're going to have to come together in the legal uh, context, really, to um, uh, grapple the, the sort of problem that we're experiencing. So these are some of the uh, common points that are put forward uh, by folks like my, my friend from swimming, who wants to talk about these things and, and discuss whether or not we really need to have this sort of a collective response. Well, yes. Right? Climate change is international in nature. Well, so are many of the major problems that we're experiencing from an environmental uh, or human health perspective right now. Okay? We have greenhouse gas contributions that are coming from all states. Right? And yes, some states within those regions are disproportionate greenhouse gas emitters, right? as is Alberta in the Canadian context. Uh, Canada right, has an international commitment we have agreed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, are we on track to meet this? No. Have we met any international commitment that Canada has put forward voluntarily? No. Okay. Rather, we have more spectacularly failed to meet them uh, than we've had to, or than we have made. Um, I think the, the strong efforts that we could to get there. All right, so this is a Canadian obligation, an obligation that exists in independent of other countries of the world. All right, so we can't say uh, because other states have to do something that we shouldn't. We'll come back to that uh, in due course. Second, greenhouse gases, other than some, some you know, other environmental issues that we might experience, are integrated in society. All right, and this is what has made it a wicked problem to try and regulate. Okay, so it, it exists across economic sectors. All right, and it's also ingrained in a lot of aspects of our day-to-day -day Western lifestyle. Right? It's kind of the status quo. And so disrupting that has costs and consequences, political and real, right, that we have to try and grapple with. And then again, climate change, as a lot of people like to point out, it's incremental in its impact. It's happening, it's occurring, it's significant, and it's serious, but at the same time, it's incremental. All right, so what that means is, for a lot of people, as you're going about your day-to-day -day life, as you're contributing to the issue, 
you might not be noticing that things around you that are having impacts or consequences are attributable to something like climate change. And that makes it uh, a difficult consequence or, or a difficult environmental problem to regulate also. So that's enough about our, our setting the, the stage for the climate aspect of it. How about the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? This is what you came here to learn. So this is my obligatory slide to make sure we come away with uh, some fundamentals on the Charter. All right, so we know that the Charter is part of Canada's Constitution. It has been since 1982. It represents the highest or the supreme law of the land. It's an expression and a representation of Canadian values that generally apply to everyone in Canada, be it a citizen or otherwise. It protects us against certain forms of state action or inaction, and it contains both rights and freedoms. All right, so it's a really important document. Um, it's our major human rights instrument uh, at the federal level, and so there's a lot that might be implicated by, uh, by the climate change scenario. Now, as Pat mentioned, I mean, we have this ongoing dialogue or discussion about whether or not environmental protection and environmental management is something that is relevant to the Charter or something that is currently protected by the Charter, and that's an ongoing discussion. Okay? In the academic community, it's a really live and, and a uh, hotly contested debate and discussion. Day to day, you know, it hasn't really played out in too many uh, major cases or decisions. And there's none directly on point to try and clarify the issue for us. But there are a certain, or there are some certain points about our constitution and the environment that warrant right, uh, some discussion for uh, figuring out what the application to the charter may be. Well, first, the environment itself is not mentioned anywhere in our constitution, including the charter. All right, so maybe this isn't too surprising that some of our early constitutional documents from the 1860s exclude something like the environment, because the environment, as we currently understand it and talk about it, is really a 20th century phenomenon. So it's not surprising that it's not there, right? That those early documents do deal with some natural resources, which were of concern uh, to the, the early Canadian economy, uh, but they don't deal with the environment uh, for uh, the environmental purposes itself. Okay? Neither does the Charter. Now, when the Charter was uh, put forward in, in the 1980s, uh, the environment was obviously well understood. All right? There was a robust area of, of law called international environmental law and a robust area of law called domestic environmental law that both operated in the Canadian context. But Right? There was some early discussion about including something like the environment in the Charter, but it ultimately wasn't uh, included. And there were some other conspicuous absences as well, right? like private property. Okay? It doesn't get the same sort of uh, constitutional protection in the Charter uh, as you might see in a, an American context with their constitutional documents. So, in that sort of absence, Canadian environmental law generally looks like something a little bit different. All right? We have uh, elected lawmakers that have produced a wide range of environmental laws across a whole host of issues, both federally, provincially, and municipally. Okay, so we have pollution reduction laws, we have nature conservation laws, resource management laws, and then of course climate change laws. Okay, so we have an ever-growing uh, area of climate change law and policy that touches uh, on the many uh, complex issues related to the problem. Uh, these laws also involve for, or allow for some participation by citizens, so we hear a lot about environmental impact assessment and those sorts of processes. And so that's a procedural aspect of uh, the environmental regulatory scheme that exists in Canada as well. So that's what we commonly think of, the statutes and the regs that are out there dealing with environmental protection. Well, we also have rights that we hold as citizens. Okay, so every citizen has the ability to assert their rights against others okay, in civil court. And this can include nuisance, trespass, and negligence. All right, and those all bear on environmental issues. Environmental pollution can constitute a trespass, a nuisance, or can be released negligently. Okay, so we have the ability to enforce our laws that way. So that's all really interesting, uh, and there's, there's tons of, of reading and material that can be done to understand the Canadian environmental law scheme, but I guess the question that we're asking today is does the Charter facilitate any action by citizens against the state to get some relief in the context of a claim that is asserting harm or rights infringement by climate change. 
right? Does that exist? Is that something that we can look to as a new area of uh, environmental law that, that might have uh, some impact or some purpose as we look at all hands on deck and mobilizing uh, the discussion about how law is going to operate uh, in the climate change context. So here's the, the section of the day. All right, so again, this is the, one of the key take homes. Section seven of the charter all right, says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Okay, so the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, but it's not a full stop. All right, because these are legal rights, but they're not absolute. Okay, so there can be infringements or derogations from these rights, but if those are going to stand, they have to have been done uh, in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Okay, so it becomes kind of a two-part uh, balancing here. Now, Section 7 most frequently operates uh, in the criminal law context or in the broader administration of justice as Canada's uh, officers of, of law enforcement seek um, really to enforce uh, compliance with the laws and policies of, of, of the Canadian state, but we know that it's also applicable beyond that context. And we've seen some application of Section 7 in, in the healthcare sphere. All right, and there's discussion about broadening it further. So it doesn't just have to be around um, uh, criminal issues. We can see the application of Section 7 uh, in other areas of public life. And so, why not think about its application to the, the area of environmental protection, right, or climate change management? Is that uh, something that would invite okay, some sort of, of um, analysis or analogy that we could then say uh, is on point to this sort of an issue? So that's uh, a, live, a live question. And, you know, before we jump into that a little bit further, you know, I can reiterate the point that I made a couple of years ago doing one of these talks, is that we haven't seen direct application of this section uh, in an environmental protection context more generally or more broadly. Okay? And one of the common uh, arguments that's put forward that questions the applicability of Section 7 to climate change and the Charter more generally is if we can't make it operate in traditional environmental pollution contexts, Right? If we can't make it operate for a community that is exposed to high levels of heavy metals or other sorts of, of um, acute and toxic substances, then how can we make it operate in the context of something like climate change, which has a different set of purposes associated with it? Right? Where causation and attribution um, are always going to be issues and, and a couple other hurdles that we've seen in climate litigation. So, some might say it's a bridge too far. All right, and that we need to work on incremental development uh, of kind of the, the application of Section 7 to different environmental harms before we're likely to see its, its day for something like the climate context. Okay, so that's, you know, one of the, the hurdles here is uh, this might be jumping a couple steps, all right, of, of application of Section 7 to a healthy environment uh, to, or, or to environmental protection, which could be then the building stones uh, to make its application stronger to something like climate change. Right? So, maybe ironically, in order to understand how this could operate in the context of Canadian litigation or jurisprudence, how about we take a trip to the Netherlands? Okay, so climate change litigation is happening all over the world. Um, there are currently thousands uh, of climate lawsuits that have been initiated, and these lawsuits have taken different forms. All right, there's lawsuits against the state for failing to take adequate action to achieve domestic reductions. There is litigation against the big uh, polluters, okay, the, the largest oil and gas polluters for their responsibility, or their share of responsibility uh, for the climate change issue. There's even civil actions, okay, so nuisance, claims that have been brought forward and negligence claims that have been brought forward uh, individually and as class actions, trying to hold different uh, actors responsible. In 2019-2020, um, there has been a big surge towards young people suing governments. And people have probably heard about some of the cases around the world, uh, the Juliana case down in the US where a group of youth are suing, uh, starting in Oregon and Washington State, hopefully moving their way up through 
uh, the different federal court systems. In Canada, uh, there was a, a class action lawsuit in Quebec brought on behalf of everyone 30 years or under. Okay, so I would have missed that one, unfortunately. Uh, and then we have a, a recent statement of claim filed by a group of 15 youth from across Canada that, that directly impacts on Section 7. And that's where we'll go uh, after we look at probably the most successful uh, climate litigation case to date. All right, and someone, some, something that is, I think, quite relevant to what we're talking about because of the human rights aspect that was engaged uh, in the litigation. So, 2015, the Jurgenda organization from uh, the Netherlands ends up suing the Dutch state. Okay, so Jurgenda gets its catchy name from Urgent Agenda. It's a citizen platform, hundreds of members uh, that are all interested in a common cause and that being more effective climate mitigation and adaptation. Now, they sued the Dutch government uh, initially in hazardous negligence, okay, something that is permissible under their constitutional structure. So, quasi-constitutional slash tort claim. Okay, hazardous negligence, uh, the crux of their, their argument there was that by failing to take adequate domestic action, they were hazardously exposing their citizens to the negative consequences of climate change. Okay, they were contributing to those risks uh, contributing to those harms. But then what became interesting is as the case moved on, Urgenda ended up relying quite heavily on a regional human rights convention called the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, to which the Dutch state is a part, and to which that international treaty becomes part of its constitutional documents. Okay, by the way, uh, its reception of law works. So that's the, the, the principle that is going to be quite relevant to our discussion. Now, what did Jurgenda seek? Okay, well, they went to the court for an order requiring the government to achieve a more significant greenhouse gas reduction target by the end of 2020, right? So in 10 months' time, than the Dutch government had voluntarily agreed to. Okay, the Dutch target, so this was their formal target, just like Canada has that 30% Right, below 2005 by 2030 target, was between 14 and 17 percent compared to 1990 levels by the end of 2020. All right, that was their, their kind of most recent uh, target that had the, the closest horizon. Now, Jurgenda pled that the court should order a reduction between 25 and 40 percent, okay, which is quite significant. All right, so it would be quite a significant uh, bump in what was. Uh, being pursued by the court, and it's also a bump that would be a, have to be achieved quite quickly, all right? Because litigation started in 2015, the targets by the end of 2021, 20, uh, and you can or 2020. So you can imagine if you have six years, okay, you'd have to take fairly drastic action. Your power sector would have to change. Probably coal-fired uh, electrical generation would have to be phased out fully and, and very quickly, um, and then you could look at some other. Uh, kind of incremental changes to hopefully achieve that. So that was the, the crux of the litigation. Now it's interesting because it's a, a citizen group essentially asking the court to set an international obligation for the state. Okay, which, which, which raises some issues when you start thinking about separation of powers, when you start thinking about who actually gets to set these sorts of targets. In Canada, it's the executive branch of the federal government. They have authority to set this, all right? And it would be kind of controversial, I think, if we saw a court kind of jumping into that other sphere, right, of government to then make this sort of an order. And so the, the case is quite interesting for that um, uh, principle as well. So let's see how this played out uh, during trial and then up through appeal. So at trial, Yurgenda ended up being successful, all right? And the court, uh, found that they were successful primarily on hazardous negligence. And based on that finding, they granted the order as initially requested, but on the low end. Okay, so the court came out and their formal order was that the Dutch state had to reduce their emissions, right, overall by 25% by the end of 2020. Right, so quite a significant uh, order from the court. And the first time that this sort of a, um, an order had been granted by a court uh, anywhere in the world. Okay, so all of a sudden we have an interesting climate precedent uh, 
um, which there was some sort of, some uncertainty about because, well, you know, there were two other levels of appeal that could happen, um, and there was some uncertainty about whether this was a rogue trial court, right, which would then be straightened out as it went up to appeal, or whether or not the reasoning would stand. So as you'd expect, the government appealed, but what wasn't uh, expected was that you're going to cross appeal, and this is where the European Convention on Human Rights became relevant, because they argue, okay, in their appeal, that the court should have also looked at liability based on the human rights breach, okay, or a human rights violation. So they doubled down. They said not only are we, we were satisfied with the initial finding, okay, on the hazardous negligence side, but we also think there should be liability uh, for this human rights aspect or dimension. And so it went up uh, from the, the district court to the Court of Appeal in The Hague, and this is the section that ended up uh, really carrying the argument uh, before the, the decision makers. And so there's a right to life section, okay, so it sounds kind of similar to what we saw in section seven. Uh, and this right to life section in the European Convention says that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law, and that no one shall be deprived of his life intentionally, save in the execution of a sentence of a court following his conviction of a crime, for which this penalty is provided by law. So it also has primary application in uh, kind of the criminal administration of justice spheres, but has also had application beyond it. Um, and what is also interesting about this section is there's precedent for it being used to force government action. Okay, so a positive right requiring the government to do something. Now, section seven of our charter is usually framed in the negative rights uh, perspective, which is going to limit government action or interference with individuals, whether uh, and, and not be used in a different way, which would be to force government action. All right, and so here, okay, the, the plaintiff group was saying, we want this section to be used to force government action. That the, the extent of government action to date on addressing the climate issue is insufficient, and we want to drive it forward by the court declaring that there has been a breach to the protection of, of uh, life that is otherwise guaranteed by the risks that are posed by climate change. And so then this ended up um, really monopolizing the majority of uh, the Court of Appeals decision here. Um, there were some interesting concessions that were made. Okay, so the Dutch state upon appeal conceded uh, the climate change did pose risk to its population, but argued that those risks were insufficiently specific and too global in nature to be protected against by the human rights instrument. Okay, so we see some of those key points, right? International in nature, somewhat unspecified, okay, difficult to drive uh, an, uh, a causal attribution to at some, uh, some moment in time. Okay, and those were, were the, the arguments that were being utilized by the state here. In response, the citizen group said that the risks of climate change were sufficiently hazardous and sufficiently serious uh, to immediately trigger a human rights breach, okay, under section two. And they pointed to some examples of what uh, was documented in peer-reviewed climate science uh, as to events that were being experienced by uh, the Dutch population. So we have heat stress, okay, and the hazards that are associated with that. Uh, an increase in the rate and intensity of hazardous weather, disruption of food and water production and supply, sea level rise and coastal erosion, right? and then impacted air quality, okay? which, which interacts with, with traditional pollutants. Right? So that's kind of the, where the competing thrusts of the argument that were, were made before the court. And the Court of Appeal ultimately accepted <clears throat> that without adequate climate policy, these risks, okay, and the risks of it, without having to say, to point to an individual and to say with precision, that is the individual that suffered that harm, it was the risks and the significance of the risks, uh, could be borne by hundreds of thousands of Dutch citizens, all right, and that because of the magnitude of those risks, additional preventative action was required by the state. Additional preventative action was required by the state. Okay, so then, when you come to the conclusion that additional action is required, where are they going to fit that level of action? What was the appropriate order 
uh, ultimately coming down uh, from, from the court. Well, to get there, the court looked at international law, okay, because we have a, a functional international climate change approach. We have developed states and developing states around the world that have uh, different uh, obligations based on their level of contribution and their level of ability. So they looked to international law and on a European legal doctrine of common ground, okay, known as common ground, they looked for a target that had a high degree of consensus amongst developed states. All right, so they said, is there kind of a common target, a common reduction goal that we see amongst developed states? All right, and that ended up being that 25% level. That was a common international obligation for developed states that would be in an analogous position. All right, so they were able to say, yes, we can find what we think is a suitable level of reduction, a suitable target, based on kind of the peer jurisdictions uh, that are also doing the same sort of thing. And then they said, and this is important also, the state has a positive obligation to take additional action based on their shortcoming. And that's something that we may or may not see under Section 7 litigation in the Canadian context. All right, you're more likely to see uh, a recommendation or an order that the state refrain from doing something rather than the court ordering that the state take positive action or take uh, additional steps. Okay? So that was one order of business that the court had to uh, address. And then the second one was this another kind of the common argument. Okay, well, what, what do we make of the fact that overall the Netherlands contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions are negative? Okay, what fact do we make of you know, the, the country only contributing like 0.8 or 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions? Is that something that should then scuttle right, the ability to find a breach or, or, or a violation here? And I think this is really important language from the court because this answers that common question that people have. Right? The question where, well, you know, Canada is about 2% of the global emissions. 2% of the global emissions. Right? If the US and China don't do what they need to do, if these other large emitters don't do what, uh, do what they need to do, then our, right, our actions are going to hinder right, our own economy and they're not actually going to make uh, that much of a difference. And so the court met that argument head on and said that each state is subject to its own obligations. Each state has an independent obligation to act. All right? um, you can't rely on the fact that your friends are doing something substandard to then say, well, then that justifies our sub -sub substandard behavior also. Okay, so it's, it's an inappropriate <coughs> argument when you're dealing with something uh, of this magnitude. All right, the independence of this state uh, requirement uh, is going to obligate them to address to the extent that they can the harms that are associated with climate change. All right, and the mere fact that other states are failing to meet their obligations should not diminish your responsibility to do your best, right? To conduct due diligence to meet your own, okay? And then, you know, I think they, they flipped it a little bit and said, rather than saying, our contributions are minimal and our reductions are going to have a minimal impact, they said, rather we need to look at every additional reduction having a positive impact on avoiding dangerous climate change in the future. Okay, so they, they invited right, the, the parties to, to shift the way that they were looking at uh, this sort of an issue and then to reframe it as, as owning the responsibility rather than shirking uh, the responsibility for potential violations. Okay, so that's the, the high water mark for international or well, litigation that's happened on the international stage. All right, it was appealed up to uh, the highest court in the Netherlands, which agreed with the reasoning uh, of the Court of Appeal uh, and confirmed it at the end of 2019. Um, and it's really being looked at as a potential uh, watershed moment for, for future climate litigation if it can be framed in a way that can capitalize on some of those uh, highlights and avoid some of each jurisdiction's unique pitfalls. All right? and so, you know, is this something, or, or is this the sort of litigation that we could look to in the Canadian context and say, right, this makes sense, this is possible, or this is, this is achievable here, all right? Well, unfortunately, first, we have no case law that's directly on point, all right? So these are novel claims. These are test cases, okay? And when I say a test case, 
I don't mean that um, they're, they're doing it just for the sake of trying to, to get some sort of a decision, but it's a test case because it's breaking new water, it's breaking new ground. But they are doing it just to get the decision. Ultimately, that's all they're going to get is the decision, and it's not going to change anything. That's the fallacy of the, the whole charter argument, that if you change the charter, then something's going to change. It's the whole part of law that rule of law makes something change. Well, which law? When? For who? That's that the confusion that the law creates when you say, we can fix this by doing this, getting this case done and over with. I'm sorry for, for jumping in, but Jump it's, on in. it's just so compelling of why this won't change anything. Because everybody's going to say, well, that law applies to you in that circumstance, but not to me in this circumstance. Sure. And that's why nothing changes. Sure. So even I mean, for the, the most obvious. Excuse me, sir. Present. Let's let our presenter finish his talk, and then, by all means, please go ahead and ask yeah. the question. Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I, I take your point. I just think if we, it's a, it's a rather realistic uh, point on law. I mean, I think that for every ten failures, you have one success that changes something for the future trajectory of uh, society. I think you're best to look at the one out of 10 that does something as opposed to the nine out of the 10 that fail. But we can have a further discussion on point. Uh, but I'd also invite you to, to reflect on uh, what I said at the beginning, which is that this won't solve the climate problem. All right, I said that it's an all hands on deck legal issue, which is going to take action from all sources of law. This is just one angle. One angle for the purposes of discussion and, and, and argument. And did it change anything in the Netherlands? What do you think? Did that court order, right, from the court, which said you have to achieve a more significant reduction, change anything in the Netherlands? Yes. All right. There are additional actions that are now being taken that were not going to be taken by the state, which are going to be implemented and effective by the end of this year. So the law had an effect. Okay. So when you have successes uh, that can work their way through, then you can have some 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 practical uh, implications on the ground. So. Uh, Value judgments aside for now, let's take a look at what uh, is being argued or uh, what might happen in the Canadian context. So, no case law directly on point. This is a test case that has some uncertain application or outcomes. It was a statement of claim filed uh, in the federal courts back in October 2019. And it's really um, litigation that, that captures an emerging theme across jurisdiction, and that is litigation that's being engaged by the youth, right? Because we all know that uh, the, the dire harmful, the more severe consequences of climate change won't be borne uh, by me, won't be borne by many of the people that are sitting in the room, but will be borne by my five and three year old kids that were swimming uh, in the pool yesterday, or their kids, right? That's uh, the way that the scientific models are, are projecting out on this. So, these plaintiffs are youth aged 13 to 18 from across Canada. Their claim, generally stated, is that Canada's contribution to the destabilization of the climate system deprives them of health or the proper conditions for development, so that would be security, uh, and alters their chance at survival, which is their claim as it relates to life, uh, in a manner that does not accord with the fundamental principles of justice. Okay? Their allegations are broadly similar to the allegations that you saw in the Yergenda decision, uh, we have events like uh, severe weather, thawing permafrost, uh, an increase in diseases and disease vectors, and a movement of diseases and disease vectors. And so one of the plaintiffs uh, is an individual that's afflicted with Lyme disease that was living in an area that didn't traditionally have Lyme disease. Okay, so those are some of the issues you see playing out. There's flooding, uh, wildlife and smoke and allergens with respect to air quality. Uh, and disproportionate impact on First Nations communities who are exercising their traditional rights. Because from a climate justice perspective, right, it will be the First Nations communities, especially those that uh, continue to carry out significant uh, traditional rights on the land that are going to uh, feel the first uh, major effects of this. Right? So what was the relief that was being sought? Right? Well, relief was first with a declaration of a breach, Okay, so a declaration that there had been a breach uh, of Section 7 and also Section 15, which is not what we're focusing on. And then the claim for relief is the looking for an order that compels the development 
of an enforceable climate plan that accords with Canada's responsibilities. Okay? We all know we have the Pan-Canadian Climate Change Framework. We all know we have associated measures. At the best case scenario, we still have a 40 or 50 megaton gap between our international commitment and, and our federal action to, to achieve that. Okay, and so they're looking for a legally enforceable climate plan that would close that gap. Okay, that would, that would, that would move us towards 2030 compliance. All right, as opposed to, yet again, hitting another milestone uh, where we missed the, uh, the key target. Okay, so it's uncertain, right? It's uncertain as to what is going to happen. All we have right now is the statement of claim. And so we can anticipate that this is going to move its way through the court system. Uh, drawing on the experience that we saw in your agenda, I think we have to ask first, uh, what facts, as pled, will the government concede? Remember, the government in, in the Uganda case uh, conceded that there were risks that were posed by climate change to uh, the Dutch population. Are we going to see similar concessions uh, that are made by the federal government here, especially in view of some of the other rhetoric that we've seen uh, around the importance of addressing uh, the climate problem. Uh, second, could this open the door to Canadian courts finally giving express treatment to the long-standing theory that the right to a healthy environment is implicit in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Okay, could this be a case that then opens the door all right, to future litigation or future discussion about the application of uh, the Canadian Charter to this? Does insufficient government action fail to accord with the fundamental principles of justice by failing to exist or address the existential threat of, uh, posed by climate change or for being arbitrary or grossly disproportionate to the extent of existing climate risks? And could successful climate litigation expand federal authority to manage or regulate greenhouse gases more broadly? Right? And then that's, you know, here we are in Alberta, uh, with quite a bit of concern right now about, you know, the extent to which um, uh, the Carbon <coughs> Pricing Pollution Control Act may or may not allow an expansion uh, of federal regulation into different areas of provincial authority under the constitutional framework, right? And that could also be a future, excuse me, implication of a decision like this. All right, so <clears throat> here's a nice picture of the plaintiffs. Uh, in the current case, so you can see the age ranges, uh, diversity and background, and, and each has their own particular story with a health condition or a living condition or uh, a lifestyle that has been impacted by climate change. And so it's an interesting read uh, if you want to take a look at, at kind of uh, really the, the most recent action in uh, Canadian litigation and, and climate change uh, from a youth perspective. So um, I know that there might be some questions. Uh, about implications or possibilities or those sorts of things about it. I'm happy to take any of them for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah? Can you comment on the Heathrow Airport being shut down by reference to the, the Heathrow Airport expansion by reference to the, the Paris Accord? No, but if you, if you can give me a bit of... Yeah, so the question is if I could comment on the Heathrow Airport expansion being shut down vis-a-vis -vis the Paris Accord commitments, and I, ha I haven't read on it. Yeah, I haven't, haven't so read on it. The expansion of Heathrow Airport was stopped by reference to the Paris Accord. Yeah. And the question I would have is, could reference in Canada, could reference to the Paris Accord, even though it's not binding, have an impact on the legislation? Yeah, so, so, no, it's a great question. I mean, so, and this is one of the things I think that in the climate change sphere is really frustrating for us because, and we can go maybe not as far as something like Heathrow, but we could look at, say, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, right? And one of the questions that's left unanswered is where does this fit within our longer term vision, okay? And one of the things that we don't have a clear answer for out of the environmental impact assessments or out of the rhetoric that's being talked about it is what is the projected lifespan of this infrastructure and what is the expected, right, contribution uh, of greenhouse gases domestically through its construction, through uh, the combustion to get the substances that then go into the pipeline, how do you fit that within our 2030 uh, and then beyond commitments? And that timeline hasn't been done yet. So that thinking hasn't been done. And I think that's one of the major um, shortfalls, right? And unfortunately, um, 
when I said it's integrated and it's difficult, these sorts of, of decisions, they require thinking beyond your four year electoral cycle. Right? These decisions do not meet with a regular electoral cycle, and uh, you know how many of our uh, you know of our, of our politicians, provincially or uh, federally, are going to take a strong stance on trying to meet those targets, rather than focus on re-election and other aspects of their uh, political agenda. Right. Yeah. This isn't properly uh, related to the charter, but, so if you excuse me for asking. When you mention owning the responsibility, it immediately raises, brings to mind government's fiduciary, deemed fiduciary responsibility to its citizens. Now, I, citizens, now I understand this is an emerging field, but certainly unsettled and outside the chart. Yeah. But uh, it seems to me that, that pursuing that additionally is, is, a, is an entree to getting the action that we need on climate yeah. change. And I'm just wondering what your opinion is. Totally. With, and I'm sorry for asking something outside the No, no, and it's not outside at all, because I would say that um, uh, maybe you're speaking to the public trust. And sure, well, yeah. that would be one. Yeah, so the question is, Canada is emerging, the emerging idea that the government has a fiduciary obligation to its citizens to act in their best interest uh, for dealing with natural resources and environmental protection. Uh, in the U.S., they have the public trust doctrine, uh, which you know protects citizens right to use resources and to have clean water in certain contexts because of the state's obligation to those citizens. So it mandates a certain level of regulation. Canada has flirted with the public trust doctrine. Okay, We have said that we recognize that it's part of our legal inheritance as having application in the British common law, but we never specifically received it or utilized it within our own um, um, kind of, kind of uh, uh, jurisprudential considerations. There have been cases, there's a famous Supreme Court case, Canfor, uh, forest products, which the BC government argued fiduciary obligation to try and get environmental damages for protected trees that were burned in a, a negligent forest fire. The court said, we think it might exist, however, these are not the facts, and so we'll leave it to another day. Okay? Uh, so it's great judicial reasoning, um, but the plaintiffs in this case also plead, so in the LaRose case, they also plead public trust. And so I think they go hand in hand with you have, right, and it's a mismanagement of Canadian natural resources or of environmental quality, which is breach of an obligation that is owed to us, right? And they go hand in hand as two areas that have, um, that are, are related to the problem, but don't have a significant history or, or experience or practice in Canadian law, which makes it difficult to then drive them forward. But it's not 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 precluding its possibility. But it, it's on point. Do you think it's a, a, re a reasonable approach? Because I it, it may get there quicker. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that uh, um, I think that the public trust argument is quite reasonable, uh, and that it can it can help mandate a, a certain level of protection or a level of control. You could use the public trust to try and you know, guarantee some level of, of atmospheric protection or terrestrial or aquatic protection, for sure. Um, you would just have to kind of open the door to that uh, application. Yeah. Yeah. So have you uh, thought more about, or thought about John Burroughs' argument that basically treaties uh, that we made and are our only claim to being able to use or enjoy the land were all based on an indigenous understanding of the land that it was preserved for seven generations. Mm -hmm. And the principle of law, you can't give more or trade or provide than you have in the first place. So since the indigenous concepts of law have been accepted as part of our constitution, isn't that the best argument to argue from the environment point of view? We have to think of the seven generation rule, which is how we receive the land from the First Nations. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful question, um, and I think we're getting, you know, environmental law and indigenous management, I mean, these things are, are increasingly intertwined and, and influenced by one another. Um, again, the, the, only, the only shortfall, I, I agree that it would be a very suitable way to move this forward, like application of Section 7 to climate change litigation, I think there's some incremental developments that will have to happen before we can get its, these sort of principles broad application to these, these wicked problems.
Um, you know, we're, we're, we're every day, right, the process of reconciliation is, is understanding the application and uh, um, content of Indigenous laws uh, more fully of these principles as they apply. And then once that, I think, once that process continues, its, it's next uh, question will be how do we, you know, how do we put it into work? Uh, we've seen certain cases that have talked about this, but uh, I think it was the Jokotan decision on land title, which mentions something akin to the seven generation principle, but says that it's only going to burden the First Nations peoples that are managing that land, right? And so then we see some, uh, you know, some, some lingering colonialism because you have, right, the court saying you have to manage your land this way, whereas we're free from these general obligations. And so I find that, in that context, dangerous, but with a broader application, I think that there could be some, uh, some really interesting outcomes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is just raising the whole question of the framing of Section 7 has to do with person to person. Now, I'm going to bring up something negative about that in the sense that there's also legal personhood as it applies to corporations. Yeah. And just a quick question. Does the Charter actually uphold that legal personhood of corporations? And because... Uh, levels of government have not seen fit to actually uh, not punish but uh, uphold the laws about emissions and and all kinds of pollution with respect to you know even accidents or you know holding them legally responsible mm -hmm. so how does that particular thing about personhood I think there's it's, it's a pretty big yeah. uh, uh, it's a tough stone there. Yeah, and I can't, I can't speak directly to Section 7 in the context of a, a, like a business law context. That's just beyond my area of what I read or explore. Um, but I would say, in keeping with the theme of kind of pushing some of our boundaries here and the legal personhood idea, um, the law has seen fit to expand legal personhood to include legal fictions such as corporations. Right? We give them authority, we give them um, uh, ability to act as a natural person. Um, and I, I think it's high time that we think about expanding the rights and protections to more than just corporations and also think about their application to the natural world, right? To ecosystems and to species uh, and to different non-legal persons uh, that could also then gain some of the benefits or if not the charter, other rights-bearing documents. You mean like to apply liabilities? To apply liabilities, for sure. Right? So look, right, you can find an endangered species and, and actions that have right, pushed that species to the brink. You could find liabilities for, right, on behalf of that species, freestanding liabilities against those that have, have acted in that way. Yeah. So we have lots of questions now that have gone down Nate, natural rights. We've got four more minutes. I talked for too long. I'll come back to you. Booker, let's go. Perfect, absolute, perfect issue. You're asking for corporate responsibility, but you're not asking for personal responsibility. You want to make corporations, individuals, or persons recognized with responsibility, but what with freedom. So you're arguing against yourself in the sense of, if you want corporate responsibility, how come are you not demanding personal responsibility? And it goes right back to those kids. How come they're demanding government responsibility when they're not taking any responsibility for their own actions? I want to go to Disneyland. I want to go swimming. I want a Game Boy. I want to go to McDonald's. So the personal actions of collective billions of individuals on the world are what overwhelm any kind of car charter implications of individual or corporate responsibility. And that again goes back to my original point of this is a distraction from what's going to really change things. It's an individual doing the right thing for everyone. Duty to others over self. And that's why China's working. Because they've accepted a, corp or a, a collective responsibility for containing COVID over the individual rights. And then again, back to these kids. Are they thinking about everyone or themselves? Or is it the kids? Are you saying it's the kids' fault? I'm sorry. That's every, one of those kids has, every one of those kids has a smartphone, I'm sure. And they have it on 24-7. Personally? <laughs> so I'll, I'll come back to the... So, um, you know, I think that... The, uh, I'm just one example. I, I, I disagree. Um, and I disagree because I think that there are important roles for government in organizing collective action. 
Uh, and I think that there's important roles for government in setting the rules and regulations that are going to have some of the larger impacts. I believe that, that the cars that are available for purchase and the electronics that are available for purchase and the decisions that are being made for major infrastructure projects all need to take into account the greenhouse gas uh, uh, consequences and what's available to us as consumers, uh, which are not altruistic, right? That's just a reality, I think, of, of humanity. Uh, we need that to, to come from an area where we can um, uh, look to having the best available uh, options to us um, and really, we need to be at, taking action to uh, preserve the, the sort of, of lifestyle and, and conditions that we want for our own kids or for our own future, uh, and I, I applaud them for these sorts of actions. If I could just quickly comment to the last gentleman's point, I would argue that uh, if you look at civil rights as a general, we can treat people as well as we want to treat others, but there's an expectation of the government to take in and at least establish some boundaries. Look at uh, LGBT rights. We can treat people of different orientations the way we want to be treated, but there is an expectation of the government to at least step in and set some boundaries. And I think there's a there's an analogy in environmental rights or environmental protection. But I'm just curious, do you see Section 30, because we had talked about Indigenous issues, do you see 30, uh, Section 35 and Section 7 maybe being companion in, in certain circumstances? Do you think that they can serve a similar function? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so if you go into the statement of claim, and for anyone who's interested, you can get it, it's freely available, I can share the link. Um, there are members of First Nations communities, but they, you know, often it's under Section 15 and discrimination, which you can bring that into, disproportionate, right, the, the climate justice perspective suggests that it's a disproportionate onus for certain subsets of the population that includes racial minorities uh, in Alberta or others in Canada that includes First Nations populations. So I think you can. I mean, there's learnings from both sections that, that can end up uh, cross-cutting and, and applying for, for sure. Yeah. So I see we're out of time, but I'm happy. I know I couldn't get to questions over here, but I'm happy to stay around for a couple minutes. If